joy, it's a noun, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Welcome to Grounding Journey. I'm Chris Greer. As a 40 something mom, business owner, yoga lover, and long time spiritual seeker, I've been craving deeper conversations, the kind that arise from connections with other women who are on a similar journey. My purpose with Grounding Journey is to provide a space where we can have real, fulfilling, and sacred conversations. Welcome to this week's episode of Grounding Journey. We're going to talk about joy and being joyful. I'm excited to have my guest, Katie Carroll, here to discuss the word joy. And I have to admit, it's one of my top three words for this phase I'm in right now. So when Katie decided to talk about joy, I was like, yeah! Uh, so Katie has kind of a neat story. She's a pediatric nurse and has been for 21 years. She's also a certified health coach for the last five and a personal trainer for the last four. And I was watching some of her videos on Instagram and Facebook and I was like, she has got some energy to her. So I think that's super exciting. Um, she's a passionate soul as she describes herself on a healing mission, which to be a pediatric nurse, a health coach and a personal trainer, you have got to be all about physical health training um, and healing because those all go so well together. And what I also really dig is that Katie's podcast is Thriving Joy with Katie Carroll. So I hope you'll check that out after you've listened to this whole episode. But Katie, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on. I am so super excited to talk with you and your community. It's truly an honor. Well, so I've given kind of the formal, like, this is what you do. Tell us who you are. Tell us a little bit about you that you would want to share with people. Mm. Thank you for that. You know, I definitely identify as a nurse and a healer, but lately more I have been thinking about who am I? And part of my story, or I would say maybe what has led me to where I am today is that about six years ago, working in the pediatric emergency room, I was going through my deepest burnout of my nursing career and ultimately my life. And what I knew then was that I was experiencing pain. And I feel like in life, we try to get away from pain and we go towards pleasure or joy. And so even though subconsciously I didn't know that I was seeking joy, I was on a journey to find joy. And so that led me into personal development and looking within and what I could do to help myself find joy in my life. And the things that bring me joy are things like lighting a candle. I have a candle going in my room right now. I love hazelnut coffee. I love the beach. And I am passionate about helping people. I am the oldest of three. I have two younger brothers and started babysitting when I was 12, 13 years old. And then I became a pediatric nurse. And I have always loved being the helper and now the healer. And after experiencing my deep burnout, I am now back from my journey to help people who may be on a similar journey to joy, help them find their joy and their happiness. I love everything you just said. I'm like making notes as you Thank talk you. about things I want to come back to. And I've already got three things in like <laughs> your two minutes that I want to talk about. Um, Cause I totally appreciate where you said that you were in pain and you were just com uncomfortable and that's why you seek joy. And I know for me, that's exactly why I, so my three words right now are joyful, peaceful, and connected. I have mm. them on a little sticky note on it. my computer monitor and joyful is the first one. And I think for me, I picked joyful because, um, and a couple other podcasts I've done recently mentioned this, my grandmother passed last month. Mm. She was 98. Uh, and I mean, at 98, you're like, wow, she's been here a long time. Right. And so going through the last few months of knowing it was coming and, and coming to that place of so much healing in our family and so much healing for her, that I think that's where joyful and peaceful became my words because we are uncomfortable. And it is 
it's a choice to really make that you become joyful. I found this quote and it perfectly fits with um, what we're talking about. Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Henry J. M. Nguyen, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Oh, I love that. But I think that's exactly what you're saying is that when we get to that place of discomfort, we can choose to stay in discomfort or we can not settle and know there's something better and pick joy. Mm. Yeah, I love that you say that, Chris, about choosing joy because when I was at my lowest experiencing the most pain six years ago and it didn't just happen one day i mean it had been building for months and probably years um i always thought that i would get married and have four kids and have the house and the white picket fence and the dog and i was finding myself in my early 30s mid 30s late 30s turning 40 never engaged, never married, no children. And so I felt like my life was not going to be worth anything because I hadn't achieved what I always thought I would achieve, dreamed of achieving, and in a way generationally passed on to us that that's, you know, what you do. I definitely you know, I'm a type A, I like to do well and be well. And I checked off all the boxes, right? I was like really good student in high school and I was a good daughter and sister. And I went to nursing school and I started working on a pediatric oncology floor. And I was doing all these things that I thought, you know, were great and were going to lead me to maybe joy or that life that we think we're supposed to be living. And when I found myself not there, it looked like me crying into my pillow every night to my mom on the phone and basically just asking the universe, my higher power, you know, what, what is my purpose then in this world? Because I kind of felt like I had failed myself and it took some time you know, looking back, it definitely didn't just happen. I started doing things though. I started choosing joy subconsciously again, but I knew in that moment that I could either stay this way and live this way for the rest of my days in sadness, depression, regret, which totally would have prevented anything wonderful coming into my life as we both know being spiritual people and in the world that we live in, or I could choose to start to show up for myself a little bit and do something different. So I started doing yoga and I'm not saying that yoga is the cure all for everybody, but for me it was, and you too. Yes. And I found myself lying in Shavasana at the end of class, crying in my first couple classes, the tears streaming down my face. It literally cracked me open. And I realized that here I was at 36, 37, 38, and I had this beautiful life in front of me. I mean, I was healthy And I had my parents, I had my siblings, I had friends, I had a career, yet I was looking at what I didn't have. And so I started just taking one baby step at a time. And that's truly what it was to start to reclaim my self-worth and to start to feel better, find joy. And I'm 43 years old and I hope to always be a work in progress mm-hmm. now, but this is something that I have really, really worked on over the past couple of years to come to a place where I am thriving in my life and experiencing joy. And I truly believe it's because I chose that path. And that's one of the messages that I hope people will leave here with is that we do have a choice. And what we need is already within us, but we look away from ourselves for so long that we forget that maybe 
some time alone, looking in the mirror, looking within, asking our soul and our heart, what, it, what is it that you truly want? And what is one little action step you can take today to start to get there? I, I love everything you say. And if you watch the video of this, you'll see my head shaking through the whole thing. But as you're talking, <laughs> the UPS guy was driving back and forth. So I hit mute really fast. So you don't hear me going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if you watch the video, you'll see my face doing it. Um, and, and thank you for, look, now the dog barks. The UPS yes. guy is long gone. <laughs> um, and so I appreciate you sharing that part of your story with you, with us about your expectations for your life, because I think that's huge for all of us. We all have those expectations for our lives. I was, and it's fun. I went for a medicine walk with a friend yesterday and we did a three and a half hour walk through the woods to talk about spirituality. It was amazing. It was a beautiful Southern um, Sunday in the fall. It was like 65 degrees. We were around the lake, the leaves were changing. And we talked about expectations of our lives and how we, we create these expectations like you had your expectation. Mm -hmm. I married my high school sweetheart. We had a child, you know, we got married at 23. We had a child at 25. We have literally have the white picket fence around our yard. Um, and at 35, he was addicted to drugs and alcohol. And I suddenly became a single mom working three jobs just to stay in my house. Um, so one of the things that we were really talking about is ego yesterday and how our ego blocks our joy because we set up these expectations through our ego. And that was what I went through at 35, 36 to find my joy was letting go of my ego and being who I was and finding my own purpose. And now I'm happily married to a wonderful man. He paints the white picket fence every once in a while because it's getting <laughs> a, little, a little dingy. Um, but I found that joy in my life because I didn't want to sit where I was and, and I let go of those expectations and let go of that ego. And that's where I feel we can a lot of times find, um, find our joy by not sitting in that. And so I'll ask you this, cause I want you to give me some feedback about ego, but I had this discussion. So my friend is really struggling with ego and He's a very faithful man. He's very um, about his faith and his religion and prayer, um, not religion, spirituality and prayer. And so I said to him, you know, ego is edging God out. Mm. And he had never heard that. Yeah. Have you ever heard that before? I have. I had okay. born, you know, born and raised Catholic. You know, I have heard that. Yeah. Well, I asked my son, my husband and my son's girlfriend last night and none of them had heard it. And I was like, how have people not heard edging God out is your ego? So I needed confirmation because I'm going to send this episode to my friend Rex and be like, look, we were talking about ego and you yesterday. So, yeah. so I want to dive a little bit more into the, how do you choose joy? Because it is a process and, you know, it was a really hard, dark year for me when I was going through that. And when you said, you know, you found yourself crying into your pillow, I'm like, yeah, I was there. I was so there with you. And we had different, we had the same expectations of life. We ended up in a different place, but it, it was a lesson. And I think that's something so many of us have to learn right now is letting go of those expectations so that we can truly authentically find joy. Because, you know, like I, I remember the day that I went to see my son's teacher was actually the day my husband and I split. And I said to her, you know, you need to know this is what's coming down the line, blah, blah, blah. And her response back to me was, what do you mean? Like you guys are the perfect family. You guys walk around here and everything looks great. And we were just falling apart. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of that ego where it looked like I was joyous. It looked like I was happy. It looked like I had everything, but I didn't. And you have to let go of those. So your experience was a little different if you didn't get it. And I was faking it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, but that's what we do. We either fake it or it's not what we want. So right. what kind of response do you have in the, like, how do you actively choose joy? Oh, thank you for all that. And I feel the same way with everything you're saying as I'm nodding into the computer screen and thank you for sharing your story. Um, 
and you know similar i just want to say with the whole ego thing too i found that you know i actually heard people say i heard someone say one time in the emergency room when i was working we had a nurse that worked there per diem a male nurse and he didn't realize that i was within earshot and he actually said what's the deal with katie you know in his words, you know, she's hot, she has a good job, good body, but like, she's not married. Like, what's her deal? Is she crazy? <laughs> You're like maybe, but that's not got anything right. to do with it. <laughs> exactly. It's like, I share that story, not like totally disregarding anything he said, but it's like, that stuck with me. Is she crazy? Mm -hmm. And that's where your ego is like, you know, people would kind of look at you with this tilted head and say, you haven't found anybody yet. You're yeah. so sweet. You have a good family and a great career. And then it was this kind of backhanded compliment. So you're right, the ego. And I felt similar, Chris, where in my first podcast episode, I talk about my story and how I was feeling. And it was the majority of my years working in the PEDS ER. And one of my coworkers that I worked with three 12 hour shifts a week said to me, I never knew you felt like that. Mm. because I have said that the shield of armor that I built around myself was really, really strong. Right. Absolutely. Trying to protect, you know, my heart and my soul. And so I think one of the first things that I did, I mean, when I think back, I just started Googling like self-help books, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I just started with something as simple as self-help book or self-help podcast, you know, because I, I felt like I needed help mm -hmm. and that that's the first step I think is that recognizing that you need help, mm -hmm. you know, because until my mom and my best girlfriend, Katie, you know, they both like knew I was in this space and, you know, they said like, what can we do? What can you do? You know, you have to come to realize that, okay, I need help. So it's not weak asking for help. Absolutely. I had and, to learn that really hard. That was really hard oh, to learn. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure like as a mom, you know, during that time, you know, especially for you that, you know, I feel like when, as women, I feel like if we ask for help, we're looked at as weak, or maybe that's you know, an idea that we think, but I think the first thing is to give yourself grace mm -hmm. that you're not weak. And at, actually asking for help is one of the strongest things you can do, because I always say we weren't meant to do this life alone. And I love your word connection, because that's how things get done. You know, when you're connected to your family, your friends, your community. And so the first step is recognizing that you need assistance mm -hmm. and whether that be from your family or an outside source, or, I mean, nowadays, you know, you can Google anything, you know, listen to a book, listen to a podcast. You know, I think another one of the things is finding something that you love to do and carve out the time for it, mm -hmm. you know, because that's truly finding joy, you know, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic, it forced everybody inside and quarantine and people started realizing, you know what? I ended up painting a room or mm -hmm. you know, yeah. starting pottery again or knitting sweaters because they, they were forced inside and it, we weren't distracted by everything that distracts us these days. And they were brought home one of my old business coaches, Amber Liliestrom, I just love her. And she always says like coming home to yourself. Uh -huh. And I feel like we were literally forced into our homes and mm -hmm. to stay there. And what happened is some people found themselves. They found what brings them joy. And it's realizing that you're worth carving out the 30 minutes or 60 minutes for that activity or two hours, whatever that might be so that you can continue your journey to joy. 
I definitely, I love, I, I actually just was writing some social media posts and one of them I really want to talk about is self-care isn't selfish. Mm. Like self-care is such a buzzword right now. And while I would love to have massages and pedicures regularly, like I don't, but self-care, like you're saying, do find what you love and do it. Self-care can be having a book and reading one chapter a night. It can be like, for me, one of my favorite things to do is I have the goofiest, sweetest dog, not the barky one, but the yeah. other one. And I love to just go outside and throw the ball with him for a couple of minutes because mm -hmm. it gets me outside. It, I go out barefoot and I'm in the grass and I'm in the sunlight and I step away from my desk. So even, you know, there's always that saying of you should meditate for 20 minutes a day. And if you can't, then you should meditate for an hour. And I think because self-care has become such a buzzword, everybody's like, oh, I don't have the time. I've, I've got three kids home. I'm homeschooling. I'm this, I'm that. But self-care doesn't have to be that involved. It can just be throwing the ball with your dog for five minutes. It can be, you know, like you said, it can be 10 minutes. It can be two hours, whatever you have the space for, as long as you're doing it, because that's what brings us joy. And when we're in a place of joy, I think is when we're able to connect with our purpose, connect with what the healing we get to participate in in the world right now. I totally agree. And I love that you talked about that self-care is not selfish because I've been on this, you know, self-care mission over the past couple of years. And when I first started, it was, you know, self-care, self-care. And you would hear so many times people say that, oh, well, that is manicures and pedicures and massages and coming home from work and having a glass of wine and eating dark chocolate. I mean, I'll do that too. <laughs> oh, girlfriend, I just came from a massage and I'm like, oh, I'm going to need to put the makeup on because I have like the lines on my face from the <laughs> and I was face down for the last part of it. So, um, but what I have learned is that to me, I call those like self-care bonuses. Mm. Like they're great and they have their place in the world. Believe me, like, you know, get, I love getting manicures and pedicures. And as a nurse, I remember dating a guy, my gosh, like 15, 18 years ago. And I remember he said to me, like, you know, is like, it's selfish. Like you're always getting manicures and like wasting money on having someone like do your nails. And I remember saying to him, I touch people all day. Right. So to me, it's very important to have clean manicured hands. I have my patients, I'm a pediatric nurse. The parents are looking at me, the child's looking at me, the grandparents, the aunt, the uncle. And so what I have now more talked about, and I talk once a month to um, new hire nurses at my hospital during nursing orientation on self-care. And I say that I like to interchange that word with self-preservation. Okay. Because to me, self-preservation are the things that you're doing in your life that are literally going to help save your life, like save life and limb mm -hmm. <laughs> in your nursing career and in your life. So, you know, self-preservation strategies or techniques, sometimes they're not fun. It's like going to bed a half hour earlier. It's, you know going to the food store on a Sunday when it's crowded and getting all your food and then coming home and preparing it for the week. But the reward is that all week you have healthy, nutritious food that you have cooked for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's things like drinking enough water. I mean, we all hear these things and we all say, I know I should do this. Like I should exercise more. I should drink more water. I should do yoga. I should meditate. And I love the expression when people say, stop shooting on yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. I actually just said that to my husband today. Right. Because it's not, you know, that's when we find ourselves in a pattern of beating ourselves up. Like I know I should have exercised today. No, to me, self-preservation is truly strengthening your self-love muscle, your self-preservation muscle, so that you know you're worth the 30 minutes that you're going to leave your family and go in the basement and do a workout. But unless you start with that strength of the self-care muscle, unless you start there, you're not going to feel like you're worth the 30 minutes and you're going to just give, give, give to everybody else like we do as women 
and you as a mother and me as a nurse and an aunt, you know, it's what we do. But what I have found, Chris, is that people are leaving nothing in the tank for themselves. Absolutely. And I talk about the analogy of like letting your gas tank run to empty, right? Mm -hmm. And we would never do that when we're on a road trip, right? Because like if you ran out of gas in the middle of nowhere and you don't know anybody and you're by yourself and it's raining, your car is going to stop in the middle (laughs) of 95. It does not care. And now you're calling someone to bring you gas. Right. Well, as human beings, you know, I joke that it would be really great if we had that gas gauge on our head. (laughs) <laughs> because then like when I'm at work, I could say to one of my coworkers, like, you know, you're like really headed towards E. Maybe you should go get lunch or go outside or go to the bathroom, you know, and take a break. But as humans, as opposed to the car that just stops, I mean, we won't stop. We continue to go. But if you can imagine the bottom of a gas tank, right, where I just picture like sludge and it's like greasy and it's really thick. And if that's what you're running on as a human, the only thing that's coming out of you is that sludge. So then you're not giving to yourself. You're definitely not saying, you know what, I'm worth this healthy meal or this exercise time. And then that's what you're pouring out into the people you love the most. And then into your family and friends, your community. That's what I would be pouring into my patients, my coworkers. And to me, like, I feel like that's such a descriptive picture. I can just picture it. So my mission in this world is to help women learn to love themselves exactly as they are today, learn how to fill up their cups and know that they are enough today. They were born enough and they'll always be enough. Absolutely. We are enough. And, you know, one of the things, so there were two elements that you talked about that I'm going to go back because it's going to be like, oh, I forgot you said that. Um, when you were talking about your ex-boyfriend, it was like he was self-care shaming you. Mm. And, and I think especially for a nurse, like you give so much of yourself that you absolutely deserve that. And I can only imagine how low your tank runs some days, especially if you're working a 12 hour shift and working with children is so, um, I would think it like, this is my opinion. I would think it would be so fulfilling, but so taxing at the same time. Cause I just have one kid, you know, and like, I'm like done some days and he's almost 20. So like, um, and, and I remember early on, I had a really bad migraine and I was talking to somebody and I was like, you know, I've got to do this, this, and this. And they're like, you know, you can't be a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time. Mm. And I say that to myself so often because we can't be a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time, but at the same moment, this self-care shaming is happening in our society. And to go way, way back to what you said earlier about when we ask for help, that shows we're not strong because we are in this place where women are so um, actively trying to be heard. And so many other demographics are so actively being trying to be heard that we say we have to be so strong to be heard but we can't continue to be that strong person. We can't continue to take care of others in the way that we want to, if we're not full, if we don't take care of ourselves. And so, you know, I, and I really love that you said the um, self-preservation because that, that's a whole another ball game to talk about. Like, I didn't even think about the fact that meal prepping is self-care because then all week long, you're taking care of yourself. So that was like a drop mic drop mind blow (laughs) for me of like, yes, that is self-care too. Mm. Yeah. That's, it's a huge thing for me, meal prepping. And I bring my lunch bag to work. I mean, my coworkers, you know, I've been on this unit five and a half years, so they know me well. And they're like, there's Katie in her lunch bag. I mean, this thing is huge. I should really weigh it when I go into work one day and see, but 12 and a half hours, at work and who knows if it could be more some days and I'm out of the house about 14 hours. So to me, I am like fully prepared, like that Girl Scout, right? I have like (laughs) breakfast, lunch and dinner, snacks, my water bottle. And I know that similar to the gas tank, like that's the fuel that I need because like I am taking care of beautiful children's lives for 12 and a half hours. And you know, every day, like you said, you can't be a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time because 
this is life, you know, you didn't get a good night's sleep, or as a woman, maybe you are during your cycle, whatever is happening. And so you're not 100%, 100% of the time. But I feel like if you try and you make the effort to be that way, then maybe it'll help those days where you're like really running on low and don't feel well. But then you go to the refrigerator at lunch at work and you're like, oh, there's that like awesome chicken I made for dinner or salad or whatever it might be, you know, fish tacos, whatever it is that puts a smile on your face. And then you can fuel your body properly because, you know, we're a mind, body, and a spirit moving through this universe. One of my old life coaches, I remember would always say that. And so, you know, we can't just keep moving our physical body if we're not fueling it properly with the proper nutrition, but also our mind and spirit are there too. Like we can't leave them hanging in the back, Mm -hmm. you know, and just think that, oh, well, I guess someone will take care of them. Right. Because it's part of us. It is who we are. Absolutely. And I think that part of that bringing back that mind body connection is taking care of your body to physically move it. If you Mm -hmm. sit at your desk all day, getting up every 45 minutes and just stretching, my husband's threw his back out and went to the gym to walk this morning. But, you know, I'm like, set a timer every 30 minutes, get out of your desk and move. Mm -hmm. Also, like you're saying, taking care of our bodies with the proper food, the proper nutrition, eliminating things that we know don't make us feel good or that we crash about. And then that spiritual side of taking care of our soul through the other form of self-care by taking care of your body. Like they're so hand in hand that you have to have that all together. Yeah. I know. I feel like, you know, if I can share like a little bit about, you know, the time where I was um, going through my deepest burnout, please. um, Physically, I was in the best shape of my life. I was working out so hard four days a week at my brother owns two CrossFit gyms in New Jersey. Nice. I I love it. And I got into it. And the thing was similar to like you said, when the school teacher was surprised that you were going to be getting divorced when you talked to her on the outside, it looked like I had everything together because Mm -hmm. I was in peak physical condition, but nobody knew. And I don't think I really knew that that was the armor again that I was protecting Mm. because what I say in my story is that I may have been in the best physical shape of my life and people would compliment me on my arms or my legs or my, you know, but the reality of it was that on the inside, my soul was dying. Absolutely. And I think back to that time. And it brings me to tears because I feel like I know I'm not the only person in this world who feels like that, you know, felt like that, will feel like that. And so that's why my mission now is to help women who may be feeling like that, felt like that, or still in that place because nobody knew my soul was dying. The closest people to me did not know until, until it was like the straw that broke the camel's back until Mm -hmm. I had a situation in the PDR, which just, it was just the straw that broke the camel's back for me, but then the floodgates opened and everything came out. Absolutely. And I don't want, yeah, exactly. And I don't want people to have to wait for that time. I felt like I couldn't share you know, that, that my soul was dying and, and, and not even in those words, because I probably didn't know those words. Then it, I wasn't, that wasn't my spiritual, I wasn't going around saying like, Oh, my soul is dying. I'm sad. No, like I was just crying and saying like, what is my purpose? God, like, why am I here? That's, that's what it sounded like, mm-hmm. you know? And so the, the contrast of being in peak physical condition but my soul was dying. So my mind was like, what is going on? And I was living in that kind of state for months and months. And the pain I felt that that is what has now driven me to help the clients that I'm helping, help my future clients, because I know that if I could help them get through it and 
get on their journey to joy and find joy, I know it's worth it and I know they can do it. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the ways we can really help others is you can't help somebody with something you haven't been through. Mm. Like you have to have gone through it to fully grasp and understand. Like I was telling you in the pre-talk before we did the interview is that I started a podcast so I could know how to help my clients with a podcast. You had to go through this experience of being at two different levels so that you could help your clients on an expert level instead of just giving them some fluff about how you should do it this way. Right. Like we have to experience. And sometimes I think we get so lost in our experience at the moment, especially as a healer, as a mom, as whoever, to realize that we're one growing from the experience, but two, one day we have the opportunity to help somebody else through the experience. Mm -hmm. And whether it's just through support of, you know, yeah, I understand. Like I've been there, that sucks. Or actually giving them advice because they asked for it, not unsolicited advice, but like (laughs) asked for advice or paid for advice. Right. You know, we, we, we forget that sometimes that that's part of our journey is to really be able to then turn around and offer help to somebody because we've been through it. Mm. And that sometimes helps a little bit, like when it's really deep to be like, one day I'm going to help somebody through this. I'm going to get through this. And one day it's going to benefit somebody else. And then it doesn't feel so pointless that you had to go through it. Right. You are so right. I know. Cause when I went back to school to be a health coach, I thought it was another notch on my belt to help people. I'm like, oh, I'm a nurse. It's another way I can help people, you know, once again, helping everybody else. But looking back, I actually went back to help myself. I didn't really know, but it was all about nutrition and fueling yourself properly and dietary theories and also business mindset and marketing. And looking back now, I can say, wow, I really went to help myself. So sometimes we don't realize what we're doing until it's starting or we do it, or it's a year later or two years later. And now, you know, it's five years later and now I'm helping people with that. But maybe sometimes at the beginning, we don't know that this is what it's going to look like in five years. Well, and that's a great place to throw in another quote because I'm such a quote yeah. cheesy person, um, but joy is in the journey. Mm. You know, we find that joy through the journey. Don't always feel it, but we'll find it when we look back and say, like you just said, I went to school to help my clients. And what you found was help for yourself. I am in a, a 10 month intensive yoga teacher training. So when you said yoga, I'm like, oh, I love yoga. Um, and I started it because I just wanted to deepen my own practice Mm. and, and the, that journey that it's taken me through and where it's, like you said, it's helped you and your clients that yoga. um, It's funny because with my creative agency, I had a client who was um, trying to figure out how to do a, a webinar. And I'm like, you, you strategize it just like a yoga class. And like, you lay it out, like you start with your warm up, then you do the, this, this, and this, and And she's like, oh my gosh, that was the best webinar ever. So it's the joy and the journey of look at your experience. How can you help others? What can you do with it? How can you learn from it yourself? How can you grow with it? Mm. I think that was totally off topic, but it's what it came to my thoughts. No, I love that, Chris. And I'm so proud of you for doing your yoga teacher training. That's something I do think about for my future because I do love yoga. Yeah. You know, it's been, it's been really neat and it's been interesting to do it through the pandemic because I think had I not been in the training, then I would have completely lost my yoga practice and my self-care. And I would have, you know, had that um, COVID-15 that replaces the freshman 15 for us adults, like for us women at that age, it's the COVID-15. Oh yes. But it has been moving my body. It has kept me aware of what I'm putting in my body, how I'm moving my body and really keeping me in my spiritual place. So, and I'm not saying there wasn't some dark months this summer going through a couple things that I went through with my grandmother. There was some deep darkness and I just am like, wow, what would that have been? Had I not had my yoga practice, had I not still had my self care of reading about my yoga practice, 
you know, things like that. So it's in those moments when, and I mean, going through the passing of my grandmother was not the darkest time in my life. Like my divorce, like a, a blip of raising my son, you know, but it was dark for me right now. So mm. we have those levels of darkness and I didn't even really realize how deep it was, but there's that if you take care of yourself when things are good, it's a whole lot easier to at least kind of have little increments of taking care of yourself when it's bad because it's so ingrained in your practice. Mm, I love that because that I believe in that so firmly and deeply. And when you say that, it reminds me, I actually remember saying this to people. My mom was hospitalized. It'll be three years now um, for lung cancer. They found a spot in her lung and Thankfully, they were able to remove it and the surrounding tissue and everything was clear and she didn't oh need any goodness. chemo or radiation, thank God. And um, she has been healthy since. So, But I remember she was in the hospital for five days and I was able to be off of work and I was in the hospital with her those five days I slept with her. And it was not easy because emotionally, it was a lot that's my mom. And then physically it was so taxi. I mean, she wasn't sleeping. She had a chest tube. She was sitting up in a chair and I was on the parent bed or in her bed while she was in the chair, but nobody was sleeping. And we were woken up at, you know, 6.00 AM by the surgery team. I mean, it was such a trying five days and it sounds so trivial, but like I didn't work out during those five days. Obviously I ate in the cafeteria or they also had like a Mexican place downstairs, which was really delicious. But like I ate like a million carbs, a million sugars, a lot of coffee. I didn't sleep. I didn't move my body. I cried. I worried. And I remember saying after that if I didn't take such good care of myself, I feel like that would have been even harder. And I obviously would have done that for my mom and would do it again and again for anybody I love. But I had such a strong foundation that I feel like I was able to sustain those five days, you know, being her caretaker and her nurse and her daughter, you know, that I was able, like my tank was so full mm -hmm. that it like I broke down for a couple days, but my my tank, my car, my engine, right? My mind, body, and soul had enough reserve that, you know, took me a little while to recover. Like, and then I was back to myself and my mom, thanks be to God, the most important thing was, was healing and back to herself. That's absolutely like, I, I'm writing that down. A full tank and a regular practice will get you through the times you can't take mm. care of yourself. Um, it, because it's so true and it's so important. And one of the things that I've experienced, um, you would think at 98, I was prepared for my grandmother to pass. And I wasn't <laughs> like literally at 98. I'm like, oh, um, and, and the, the funny backstory, just so I don't sound callous is that nobody in our families lived past 82. So my grandmother at 80 was like, you know, I'm going to die. I'm getting ready to die. So at 81, her birthday's in August. I mean, so for two years, it was, I'm going to die. Like, this is it. This is the time. So at 81, you know, we did Christmas. I think by like May of that year, because she would turn 82 in August, right. she'd already bought everybody's Christmas presents. She'd wrapped them. She'd written letters, everything. And she's like, well, I'm not going to be here. And I don't want y'all not to have Christmas because of me. And so, at, you know, like 82 in a week, we're like, so what are we doing now? You know? So, I mean, like I legitimately thought my grandmother was going to outlive us all. I well, mean, and I, she was like, man, I have to buy Christmas presents for these people for the next 16 years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was actually going on vacation and I left for vacation the week after her birthday, after her 98th birthday. And I called her and, you know, it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving town. Just wanted to tell you bye. And, and she's like, I'm not going to be here when you get back. And I was like, okay. You know, and they moved her to hospice while I was gone. So it, you know, it was, um, and I make jokes about it now because I've really worked through this. Like it wrecked me for a month. I didn't get on my yoga mat in six weeks. I was on my yoga mat four times and I'm normally on my yoga mat four times a week. 
but what I'm going back to is the a full tank. Like I had such a strong practice, but I also had done so much work for myself that I had so much grace for myself mm. that I was like, it's okay that right now I can't be on my mat. I'm not going to beat myself up for being on my mat. I'm not going to beat myself up for drinking a little too much wine for a week. You know, like I'm not going to abuse myself in the sense of beating on myself, just like I wouldn't abuse myself by drinking wine all the time. Right. You know, so we find that balance of grace for ourselves, whatever that is. And then what's really great is I came out of that space because I did a lot of healing work about it. I did a lot of release and I'm back on my mat and I'm on my mat four days a week at least. And it feels so good, but it also is like, oh yeah, this is home. Mm. This is where I come. So, you know, I say that in the sense of give yourself grace when you fall off, like we all do it. Sometimes we have to fall off so that we can get back on it and remember why we're on it. Like as much as we seek joy in life, you can't have it all the time because then it just becomes your everyday life. So we have to seek it. We have to choose it. Mm. And sometimes we don't get it so that we remember when we choose it and when we receive it, how beautiful it really is. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Giving yourself grace. That's something I've been working on the past couple months and it's, you know, it's a process of learning, but I do agree with you that, you know, life happens. I mean, look at 2020. Mm -hmm. So we're going to fall off. And the thing is, is that hopefully you will have what you need to be able to get back up again and continue on because we don't know what this life holds, right? We were all looking forward to 2020. Now we're all looking forward (laughs) to 2021, but it's like, what is that even going to bring? It's just craziness going on. So knowing that, you know what, even when you're feeling good and doing good and not waiting for the other shoe to drop, Mm -hmm. but just knowing that, you know, in life, there are things that happen and hard times and that, you know, when you fall, when you don't work out for a week or when you you know, go on vacation and you drink every night and eat all the delicious food. Then when you come back, you say, that was an amazing vacation with amazing memories. And I had a great time and a full belly. And you know what, this week I'll get back into it and, and it'll be okay because I've done a lot of mindset work too, where we feel like we are our mind. Like one of my great teachers, Tracy Litt is always talking about that, that we're not our mind. We have a mind. Mm -hmm. So if your mind is beating you up, like, can't believe you did that, Katie, you know, you didn't work out all week and you ate gelato every night and drank wine every night. You know, it's the same mind that I could tell myself that was really an amazing week. I'm happy. I had the time with my family and now I'm home and now it's time to get back into it. Absolutely. That's one of the things my husband and I were just talking about is like, it's okay that you went to a Halloween party and ate hot dog buns, you know, but tonight we're having salad, like, <laughs> you know, and it's, I have a tattoo on my foot and I got it. It was my gift to myself for my 39th birthday Ooh. Um, because I had been through my divorce. I went back to school to further my degree. Like I was really working on myself and through all of that, like I wouldn't have done any of it different because it was so moving and so powerful and so life-changing for me. But on my right foot is the tattoo walking with faith and grace because Mm. it's on my right foot for taking the right foot step forward, Mm. always stepping with your right foot uh, and always giving yourself grace and faith. And because that faith, whether it's spiritually, whether it's religion, whether whatever it is, but having faith in your journey, having faith that if you're alive and awake, then, and I don't mean awakened, but just awake, Mm -hmm. awake to where you are, to what you're doing, to making conscious choices, to pick joy, to pick healthy, to pick self-care. But as long as we're in that place of faith, that it will all work out. Mm -hmm. We will get where we're supposed to go because I love one of my favorite sayings from Al-Anon is you've got a big ego. If you think you can change God's plans for you. Mm, Yes. (sighs) That's what I felt too, is I felt like, you know, when I had conversations with God, when I was lying in bed, crying into my pillow, it was like, 
God, hello. Like, this is me, Katie Carroll. Like I've been babysitting since I was 12. Like I, I wanted all the kids and you know, the husband in the house, like why, why aren't you giving them to me? Like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm running out of time. Right. And it's like, you know, God is just there, like graciously loving you as you are. And he, she is so powerful and knowing that they're, they're just waiting for you to see the beautiful life that is in front of you. And hopefully you realize that, you know, sooner than later, you know, and that's what I help my clients do is that, you know, your, your gift of life is here. Like the journey, like you were saying, I love when you said the journey, because none of us are getting out of this alive. Like, I love that quote too, right? (laughs) At the end, you know, nobody is getting a, you know, first place award for having the most things on their plate or never taking a downtime day or working out for 75,000 days in a row or always eating a salad every day. Like nobody's getting an award for that. Right. But you're going to look back at your life and look at what was the journey, you know, that led me to where I am today and the beauty in that journey. And even though it was painful too at times, but there was also beauty because if it was always just pain, then that would be a whole other story, but there's beauty with it. But unless we allow ourselves to experience the joy and the happiness, or I should say, unless we allow ourselves to experience the pain and acknowledge it, then we won't be able to experience the happiness and joy because you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. It's a balance. It's that yin and yang. It's the, Mm -hmm. the scales. We have to have that balance. And, you know, I, as I said, I wouldn't change any of my dark times because they, I grew from them. I learned from them. I reflected on them and they got me to where I am, but they're also going to give me the chance to help somebody else through that. Mm. It's going to be, you know, it's all part of the journey, but it also gives me a deeper appreciation for the life that I have now for that moment that I have now compared to that moment before, like it's all, and that comes back to you to wrap it full circle and kind of wrap up the episode is it's all about choosing joy. Mm. We can look at our dark times and settle, sit in them, stay there, or we can get to that joyful place and look back with gratitude and say, thank you Mm. to that darkness. Oh, I love that. I'm receiving that right now. Well, Katie, I have had so much fun talking to you. I can't believe it's already been an hour. I'm like, I I just look down at the timer and I'm like, oh, we got to wrap this. But like, I have all these questions and and I didn't even scroll past your introduction. And I was like, oh, I need to find the question I like to end with. So, I mean, thank you for showing up for this conversation. Thank you for the authentic way it rolls. And, you know, you kept using the word journey in the last little bit. And I know I used the word journey, but that's why this podcast is grounding journey is because Mm -hmm. we're all grounding through our journey. We're looking to connect. We're looking to find like minds and like souls So that we're not alone, that we can get those little soul nuggets, those little soul wisdoms from each other. And you, I've got a page in like a front and back of notes from our call and I've already started the next page and I'm like, this was a great call. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing with the people who will hear this. And I know they're going to want to hear from you. So tell me, like, we know that you've got your podcast out there. Tell us about your podcast. Tell us where people can find you, Instagram, Facebook. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for having me first and foremost. I truly loved this and enjoyed this. And it's, it's so funny. I tell people in seventh grade, we had a typewriting class cause it was like 90, 90 right? and we made business cards and my occupation was phone talker. <laughs> nice. Which is interesting, but at the same time, I like to talk. So, you know, thank you so much for this opportunity to connect with you and your community. So yes, my podcast is called Thriving Joy with Katie Carroll, and you can find it on the iTunes podcast app and Stitcher. And you can find me at my website, which is Katie Carroll Coaching, and it's K-A-T-I-E-C-A-R-R-O-L-L coaching.com. You can find me on Facebook at Katie Cow Coaching, and I have a free um, Facebook group, Katie Cow Coaching. And on Instagram, I'm Katie Cow Coaching. And I have a free gift for your listeners. I would love to, I can send you the link. It's my um, PDF. It's my most favorite 10 
self-care techniques that you can do in five minutes. <laughs> Great. Well, and I'll list all of your ways to find you and this link on our um, show notes. So at groundingjourneypodcast.com, you'll be able to see the Katie Carroll episode that'll be listed as joy. Thank you. Yeah. It's been so much fun. I love the conversations that I have when they just flow and I'm like, Oh, and, and I think too, I'm like, are people going to listen for this long? But I didn't know it was this long. So hopefully they'll be able to carve out time. Yes. And then we'll also, we're going to do our book episode. So we'll have a bonus yes. episode released a week after this one. So thank you so much. And on the bonus episode, we're going to talk about you are a badass. So make sure you check that one out. And Katie, thanks so much for being here. It was such mm -hmm. a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for listening today. If you're seeking deeper conversations, I invite you to visit my website at groundingjourney.com or subscribe to my podcast.